wait just a second first uh, okay. continue just being to so, oh you'll you're you're handling it from then yeah okay uh, so just one thing for everybody to keep in mind is to please this is this is really a lot of more fun if if you get a chance to ask questions um the way I, I like to do is I like to have conversations. I like to be able to talk to people. And I like really like it when people get into the, uh, into the subject and we can get into the nitty gritty about invertebrates, about all these other things. Um, Sally had mentioned that my name is Mike Sanchez. I've been at the museum for a very long time. I've been there longer than Tom Williamson, believe it or not. I've been actually there at the museum now going on this year, 34 years, so it's a long time. Uh, so, uh, again, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about macroinvertebrates and water quality. And again, if you have a question, by all means, ask. All right. Let me see if I can get this going here. Share screen. There. All right. And everybody's going to have to tell me and make sure that this is working well. All right, can everybody see that okay? Thumbs up. All right. Is, uh, does anybody have any problems hearing me? Okay, so today's topic is gonna to be about macroinvertebrates and water quality in New Mexico, as you can see there. And I think what we'd like to do is start with some facts about New Mexico. First off, we are a really, really, really dry state. And I mean, when I say dry, I mean really dry. If you think about it, that is a small amount, 0.19, that's less than a quarter of a percent, less than one quarter of 1% of our entire state is covered with water. So if you took every river, every pond, every dam, everything, and put it all in one place, it would look less, a little bit less than that right there on our entire state. That gives you an idea how dry it is. The green that you see over in here, those are our mountains where you do get most of our rain. And as you are aware, I'm sure, most of the rain that we have, or most of the, the water that we get in our river is based on snowfall in these mountains and also then rain in the mountains. So if we don't get any snowfall, we have very, very little rain or very little precipitation, we, we don't wind up with water in our rivers or in our dams, which is in a situation right now where thank heavens we're getting some, but most of the water that we get is, is coming from snowpack on the mountains that melts built our streams. That said, being such a dry state, it becomes really very important that the quality of the water stays high. Now, to give you an idea as to how dry we are, how some other states stack up, just look at this. This right here, the picture on the right here, that is Rhode Island. And 33% of the state of Rhode Island is covered with water. All the little black spots you see in there, all of this is water. So what we would do with that much water, I just love it. Um, New Mexico has not always been this dry. Uh, at one point, we had very large lakes during the Pleistocene, 10, 18,000 years ago, we had a lot more water than now. Now, water's precious. All right. Uh, give you an idea as to how important water is, just to give you a, an idea. That's kind of an amazing amount. So many species of birds depend on, on our rivers and our streams and what have you. Uh, this right here is a summer tanager. It's a bird that's been hanging around our house which makes me very, very happy because I didn't know that there was anything that pretty in our area until just a few years back. When Kelly and I did a program, which was kind of neat, checking out birds, but you will not see these outside of, the, uh, outside of our river systems. All right, any questions up to now? All right. What would we do if ours yeah. was, you know, Covered, covered, in, covered in water. What would be first on the, the, the to-do list for you, Mike, if you were head honcho Albuquerque or New Mexico? I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, if, if we did have like that 33% covered in water, what would be top of the to-do list to make things better in our environment? 
Hmm. I imagine that what I would do is make sure, well, if we had that much water, first of all, it, let me put it this way. Even though there's a lot of water in a state like that, you still have to take care of it. So it would still be maintaining water quality, doing the best you can to make sure that what water you have, regardless of how much it is, is, is good quality water. You gotta remember that not just humans depend on that water, as I showed there, birds depend on it. Bugs, mammals, every other animal, all the animals depend on what water you have and you have to maintain it. Uh, there are states where they have tons of water and they also have lead pollution. There are states that have tons of water and they still have rivers that used to catch on fire. Regardless of what the water is, regardless of how much you, you'd have to maintain that water quality. So the top of my list would be definitely maintaining what quality water that we have. Does that answer your question? I think so. Okay, Thank you. so maintaining water quality would definitely be up there, regardless of how much water we have. All right. So. What is a macroinvertebrate besides something that might go well with chili? Any ideas? Did we get some hands or some comments? Don't be shy, folks. If you don't want to talk, feel free to uh, type it into the chat. Oh, does that work? Is that going to work? Can everybody see yourselves there? No, Mike, we only can see your slide that says what the macroinvertebrate. Okay, good. So yeah, we're seeing our, can... yeah, we're seeing only good. ourselves on our own. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Okay, that means that I can see everybody too. So what is a macroinvertebrate? Don't be shy. Break down the word. What does macro mean? Big. Big. All right. Big. And what's an invertebrate? Besides something that goes well potentially with green chili. Well, I think an invertebrate is something that doesn't have any bones, no vertebral column. It goes from everything from insects to all the rest of the arthropods to things like cephalopods and mollusks. It's a very diverse group, but the crux of it is they usually have a lot of legs and they don't have bones right. at least the way that we have uh, how many phyla you know what a phylum is anybody know what a phylum is mm -hmm. Part of the okay how many phyla contain invertebrates How about all of them? Every single phyla from vertebrates, from chordates, all the way through to cnidarians have invertebrate members. So for example, the, the members of the chordate family, which includes humans, <clears throat> uh, also have things like sea squirts, which don't have a backbone. So every single phyla on the face of the earth um, hat contains members that are invertebrates, all right? So macroinvertebrate is just that. It's an animal that you can see that doesn't have a vertebral column. Let me see if we can. So there we go. Here are some, um, some invertebrates. And as you can see, critters that are big enough to see without a microscope and that do not have a backbone. So we have things like snails, dragonflies, worms, you name it. It contains invertebrates. That's weird. There we go. All right. So any ideas as to why invertebrates can be indicators of water quality? Don't be shy. I know that Kelly was warning me that it would be a shy group that you may not want to talk, but I'd like to see if somebody has any ideas. Uh, well, I think that typically sometimes in indicative water, just the population of animals, I would say, right? If there's going to be a lot of water in one area, 
uh, probably that would indicate um, the amount of, uh, or rather the amount of, uh, sometimes invertebrates can indicate the amount of water, I would imagine. Or amount of healthy water. Healthy water as well, yes. Uh, and, and James and James says, um, sorry to interrupt Amadeus. Um, oh, no. James says that some of them are probably pretty picky about water quality. That's true. Some of them can be very picky and yes, invertebrates can be in, in their, their, in their environment in high numbers, but there's something that also goes along with why invertebrates are indicators of good water quality. And surprisingly, it has everything to do with their anatomy, how they are put together. So uh, invertebrates are without a backbone, but you have to think about how they are, how they're built, to get, how they're built. And that makes them much more vulnerable to toxins, to things in the environment, to how much oxygen there is, all depends on how they're built. Some are built that can really take it, others can't. And that's why they are good. It's because of their anatomy, how they're put together. So we're gonna talk about one, let's talk about a really common group that we know about, crustaceans, uh, crayfish and their, and their relatives. So think about how these critters are put together. I mean, I'm, I have, I have this thing is kind of in the way. I need to see if I can maybe figure out how to, there we go, okay. So uh, these animals have a, a heart and a circulatory system where you have blood that is being pushed around through the, through the animal, through gills. You can see right here through gills. And believe it or not, every, every crustacean from the biggest lobster all the way to the little roly poly in your backyard has gills. And if those gills dry out, they're out of luck. If those gills collapse, they're out of luck. So gills are one thing that have to, that have to be wet. They have to be wet. Um, you don't find roly polies out in the middle of the desert. You only find them in very, very wet areas because they have to be able to get that oxygen exchanged across it. So you have a heart that pumps blood through the system, pushing it through the gills. You have gas exchange occurring in the gills. And then it gets pushed back up into the, in the, around through the body where it then circulates, oxygenating the entire animal. Gills get clogged, guess what? Not happening. No oxygen in the water, they're, you're, they're pretty much out of luck. All right. Insects are also kind of really interesting and that's uh, that they have what's called an open circulatory system. Uh, anybody venture as to what an open circulatory system is? It's really kind of cool. Starts with an open circulatory system. And I'll give you a hint. See this right here? That long tube that says dorsal vessel? That is a long heart. And those little holes there along the edge are where the blood pumps through the critter. We have some comments or ideas as to how this, uh, what an open circulatory system is. Anybody? I might have an idea. Sure. Now it's been a while since I volunteered in the Naturalist Center, but um, open circulatory system, from what I remember, is sort of referring to how a lot of the veins are sort of really close to the outside of the exoskeleton. Like they're just on the inside. It, it's basically in exoskeleton is there, and I think it. Yeah, so it, it basically goes along the outside of the animal, sort of. Okay, uh, one way to think about it is how many of you have played with aquariums and had aquarium pumps or have a pond? I'm sure some of you have had aquariums in your life. None of you, none of you? No thumbs up, nothing? And actually okay. Carly, Carly and Danny actually have a couple um, questions, you know, a couple thoughts about an open circul circulatory system. Okay, um, sure. They say holes in the body that breathe air, kind of like tubercles. Okay, so an open circulatory system is very much like an aquarium pump where you have water circulating through this entire system. And the only thing that have, you have at one end is a pump 
and you have water circulating or the in, in an aquarium you have it circulating around inside the aquarium that's how you keep things wet that's how you keep things nut with nutrients um, in an insect basically what you do is you have a whole sack back here the whole animal and you have all these hearts that then are pumping blood all the way oops oops oh what the heck happened here there we go so we have blood that's circulating all the way around the critter, touching every cell, right? And then all that the, the vessel is doing, the hearts, is keeping the circulation going, all right? Within that, so now back to what Carly was saying and, and Daniel, right? What they were talking about is a system that's kind of really interesting in a lot of these insects. All insects, all of them have, in order to get oxygen, to each and every single cell have a spiracle, which is an opening. And then they have a series of trachea or little tubes that get thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. And that eventually go all the way to where every single cell is touched by the tracheal system. So air is circulated through the systems, all right? So you have air in there. And this is the way you get contact to the surface, all right? That's how you get air into the animal. Uh, I'm sure some of you probably know the answer to this. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that probably uh, Harley and Danny probably know the answer to this. Uh, and undoubtedly, Zen and Amadeus know the answer to this, but what restricts, why did insects get so large during the Pennsylvanian and Mississippian? Do you know why? Think about oxygen levels during that time. Okay, anybody? I think someone put it in the chat. Yeah, James okay. just said high amounts of oxygen. Correct. That's Carly exactly and Danny correct. say because the oxygen was lighter, I think. Yes, there was a lot more oxygen. And the more oxygen you have, the more the, the bigger you can get, because remember the circulatory system, you're allowing air to slowly dribble down. It has to work its way down into the cells. So the biggest insects that we can have today are restricted in size by first of all, the skeleton and how much weight it can take. And then secondly, by how much oxygen can go all the way through the system, all the way down to touching every single cell in the animal, all right? So all insects have a tracheal system in order to get air to every cell. And if you have an animal that lives in water, sometimes the way they get oxygen in them is to have a little siphon. So you can see this is mosquitoes right here. And the mosquitoes, they come up to the surface, they float to the surface, and that little, they have little hairs. It's a very hairs around the spiracle that then allow the air to slowly to, to so that it won't get water in there because if you get water in there you're going to mess it up it's going to drown and you can see that that can open and close and that means that you can tighten it and that way you can keep from getting water into your system or something that you don't want into the system into the system right uh, some insects have so many hairs around those things that literally what they can do is some beetles, they can trap air against their bodies and they can stay underwater and allow that air to get into their spherical systems just by contact with the, with the surface. This right here is called a rat tail maggot. You can see how it looks like a maggot, like it looks like a rat tail. And it has a little siphon at the very, very end right here that touches the very surface of the water and it allows air to get down into the tracheal system so that that animal can get the air that it needs in order to breathe, all right? So there's a variety of strategies that involve trapping air against the body, having a spiracle with lots and lots of hair that keeps water from touching it. Um, insects, by the way, you don't see deep sea, deep sea insects because they have to have air in their tracheal system, which makes them buoyant. That means that they float and you have to be able to you can only go so deep before you can't get air into the system, all right? Now, some insects 
Now remember, we have a tracheal system and some insects, what you do is you have the trachea, which is the air tube, and you have trachea that then not only get thinner as you get, so you get here, how it touches every single cell, but you also have it getting closer and closer to the surface. So what you do is you have a lot of little bitty tubules that get really close to the surface and form kind of like a gill. And that way, what they can do is you can oxygen, get oxygen to actually diffuse through the skin, the very, very thin cuticle, the skin of the outside and skin of the animal into the trachea system where you have air and then allowing there to be then oxygen getting to the rest of the animal. So here we have a damselfly and they have these great big caudal gills. You can see that's the gill. And remember that is a tube running down there that then gets finer and finer and finer that allows there to be gas exchange occurring on the surface of the, on the surface of the, of this tail right here. Greater surface area, more oxygen can diffuse through. Gills on these things. This right here is called a helgramite. And you can see that these have these tufts. And those tufts are again where you have super, super thin skin that allows there to be oxygen to diffuse through into the trachea and then nourishing the rest of the animal. All right. So gills, all right, versus siphons. And then we have things like snails, which is, uh, I love snails. They're the coolest critters ever. The gap that you see right here, this big pouch right there, that is called the mantle cavity, the mantle cavity. And you have gills right in here. And the gills then, the, the mantle is where you have the gills and that's also where excretion comes out. But this is the edge of it. This is where the shell is being produced right along on this edge here. But it does this really cool thing in some of these terrestrial snails. Terrestrial snails went from having a gill to having literally a lung. So what you wind up with is you have a circulatory system, blood pumping through arteries and veins into a very pouch, a pouch that's in here that gets capillaries and you have gas exchange just like in our lungs on this wet surface. Uh, again, stays wet, you can have good gas exchange. So there's actually kind of really neat. You have these snails that are called left-handed snails. And if you're looking at the shell, if you're looking at a right-handed shell, you look at, this is the spire, this is the top, and you can see that it opens, the opening of the shell is to the right. See that's to the right. All of these are right-handed snails. And the ones that are living in water, all of them are, have gills, all of them. This is a left-hand snail. And you can see that right here it has the opening. If you look at the spire, it opens to the left. Now, what's fascinating is that you have snails that have gone from, an from a wet environment from the ocean to the land and then gone back to the water. So these snails, this is really kind of bugging me. There we go. Ah. Well, all I have to do is touch the mouse. Sorry, guys. So what you do is you have these animals that have gone back to living in the water. And what they can do is they then have to come up to, the, they have to be able to have gas exchange so they can live in water where you can literally have zero oxygen, but they can come up to the surface in order to get that couch wet enough to be able to have gas exchange. Uh, were there some questions that perhaps on that one? So, so Liz is saying, Liz just said in the in the chat that she has to head out, but she'll make sure to watch the recording later. And thanks so much. This okay. is super interesting. All right. Well, thank you. See you later, Liz. Bye. This is this is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, any questions about that so far? So. Although uh, the snails have their uh, lung slash gill area right at the uh, base of their shell, where is their like intake? Like, ox is it through their mouth or are they no, just it's, all around? 
what it does is it enters through the mantle cavity. So you can see that there's an opening right here. Do you see that? And what happens there, and then this is the same thing. You have the shell and you have the mantle cavity is a big opening that is open from the side of a shell. Uh, if you're ever looking at some of these, uh, some of these animals, some of the, like the marine ones, you'll see that they have like a siphon that sticks up and that then has cilia or hairs on it that then draws water in through the, that little tube into the gill area. Uh, if you ever look at a garden snail, if you pick up a garden snail, look at it, and when you look straight down at it, and especially as it starts to pull in, you'll see a big opening right above where the, right by where the opening is to the shell, where the animal is kind of pulled in, and you'll see like a little pore. That is the opening into the, into the mantle cavity. So they aren't pumping, actively pumping. Well, marine snails and and ones that live in the water, aquatic, are actively pumping water in here. But snails that are living in your garden, uh, they have air that's just diffusing in around the edge of the shell into the mantle cavity and then oxygenating the lung. So they're not breathing like you are, you know, like that. What they're doing is air is then just circulating around in there. You know, they're not big animals, and so they can get the air that they need from around the edge of the shell into the mantle cavity to oxygenate that. Make sense? Cool beans, cool beans. Yeah. They have like little, they're like little ventilation guys. Yeah, exactly. Only breathing. Yep, exactly. Any other comments, questions? All right. Now we're gonna get into something a little bit more. Water quality and pollution index. So somebody wanted to find for me, what is high quality water? What is high quality water? Would it have to do with like what materials were in the water? Very much so. So what's in the water? Yes. Or the absence of things in the water. So that's one, yes, what else? Anybody else? You have any comments? Uh, I'm not quite sure, is it stuff with less toxins in it? I know that different things affect different animals uh, mm -hmm. in a variety of different ways, but I would imagine certain things, chemicals that can be generally perceived as uh, toxic would make it a worse quality and something that is more neutral to pure H2O would be higher water quality, I would assume. Okay. And also revolving around oxygen, perhaps. Very good. Anybody else? Let's see this. All right. So high, what is high quality water? You got one of them, plenty of oxygen, few pollutants and content. So that's exactly it, low silt content. So if you have high quality water, you're gonna have plenty of oxygen, not many pollutants like heavy metals, uh, chemicals, things like that, low silt. Uh, uh, James had a cool comment about a healthy ecosystem and the water content. Sure. James says in the in the chat, observe a healthy ecosystem and compare it to your water content. I think that would be a great idea. All right. So high quality water can support a diversity, a high diversity of organisms. So you can see that this is a nice picture here. You have all kinds of things. You have everything from you know, snails to aquatic insects, aquatic invertebrates, you know, just this huge diversity. So a large number of a variety of different types of animals. All right. So generally high quality water has a good diversity, right? Now, just because it's clear doesn't mean that it's drinkable. So, you know, you still wanna be really, really careful even if you have high quality water. So there's 
all kinds of systems that can clean the water fairly quickly, but nonetheless, you can still have bacteria in there. You can all have all kinds of things, ammonia. Uh, so just because it's good quality doesn't necessarily mean that it's drinkable. It just means that it, it is better quality or it's something that is easier to clean up. All right. All right. So now somebody want to define for me what poor quality water is. I see Zen. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, well, I, I can say one thing. Probably it has a lot of silt in it. It's probably okay. very not. That's one thing. And uh, probably just the opposite of what we just looked at of the good stuff. So I would imagine less oxygen and not great for supporting life. All right, so you said you I'm sorry, what was that again? Water with a lot of pollutants in it. Absolutely. So you, what you guys mentioned is dead on. Low oxygen, high levels of pollutants, and high levels of silt. All right. That adds up to low quality water. And what that means is there is a low diversity. Low diversity. Low diversity doesn't mean that there's life in there, that there's no life in there. You can have a whole lot, I mean a lot of organisms in it, but all of one type. So you can see right here, these are all called rat tail. We talked about these are rat tail maggots. Rat tail maggots are the maggots of a kind of a fly, a hover fly. And you can have enormous numbers of them in really poor quality water. You can have enormous numbers of mosquitoes in low quality water, but you're only going to have one thing. You're only going to have like tons of mosquitoes, tons of rat tail maggots, tons of whatever. This is a pond that is absolutely filled with cyanobacteria. And what do you have in there? Nothing but cyanobacteria. So, so I just want to make sure that I understand that you're talking about, when you're talking about species diversity, you could also be talking about species richness in that there's, you can have a lot of, you know, um, you can have a like species richness being a wide variety of species within an ecosystem versus a lot of one kind of species, right? Exactly. Yes. Species richness is the right way to put it. Yes. So you get a, a very, very poor, very small number of species in poor quality water, and you have a really large number of species in good quality water. All right. That is. Those are hallmarks of the different types of, of water, of, of quality of the water, all right? Um, let's talk really quickly, excuse me, the, the nitrogen cycle. So there's a lot of different cycles in, in water in, in systems. One of them is the food cycle, different things, but this is the nitrogen cycle. And here you have a fish, the fish goes to the bathroom in the water and you have bacteria and that bacteria then breaks the, uh, so you have straight ammonia, straight, straight ammonia, which is really, really toxic. The toxic, the, the bacteria, are they gonna break it down into nitrites, which are a little less toxic, but still pretty toxic. And then you have more bacteria that break it down into nitrates and nitrates then wind up being fertilizer for plants and then animals then are eating that and then you have the plants are decaying and you have the cycles. So if we're thinking about, remember we were talking about uh, waste in the water. If you have a really healthy cycle, those nutrients get, waste, get picked up and get take, cleared out pretty daggone quickly. Excuse me just a moment. Um, so it can get clean, the, the water quality can, very quickly bounce back. So if you have a healthy system, those cycles go very quickly and you can remove waste products from the system very, very quickly, all right? And remember, we were talking then about, about our fritters. And if you think about it, back over here, we have a series of animals that are probably more sensitive to poor water quality than others. So tell me, what do you think? 
an animal with gills, is that going to be more sensitive to quality to the water quality or something with lungs? What do you think? I imagine the one with the gills would be feeling the, the strain a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Things with gills tend to be a lot more sensitive. If you have a siphon on you, it doesn't matter the water or the quality there. Uh, the pollutants in there, yes, there's some, but if there's low oxygen, you can still come to the surface, you can still breathe, right? Um, animals can tolerate a lot of stuff, but they sure have to breathe, right? If you have silt, you have a silt in the system right here, silt will certainly clog up the, the gills in these things, and pretty soon these animals are not doing very well. All right, now back over here, why sample? Well, there's a good number of reasons of why you want to sample an, an ecosystem. You, you check your waters. First of all, healthy water equals a healthy ecosystem. Unhealthy water is a public hazard. Um, they were talking about, I, I was listening to this really interesting program, and they were talking about the single greatest improvement to health in the public was not by doctors, but by plumbers, because they figured out how to get clean water to people. Once you have clean water, then everything gets, uh, it's, it's just healthier across the board, less disease, less illnesses, all kinds of things. Uh, if you have a start with a, if you start with a sample, if you're giving, if, you, if you're sampling, it gives you an idea of what it needs to be done in order to improve water quality. So if you have, uh, you sample your water, you think you have it pretty good, but then you're looking at it and you're going, gee, I really have a low diversity here. What's going on? How do I fix this? How do I, how do I get it going? That's one way to do it is by sampling, but you have to know where you are. And then also sampling can indicate trends. Uh, a number of years back, there was a really bad mine spill where they had all these tailings that spilled into the Animas River in, in Colorado and then into New Mexico. And you can see how you have this beautiful, pristine river, beautiful water. After the spill, you have this horrible orange full of metals, all kinds of things. And it's taken years, years to restore it. So even though the water now is back to being kind of clear, you still have very, very low diversity. You still have very few species, you have very little things, but you need to continue to monitor, continue to monitor, to make sure that what's happening is you're going on the right trends. And if you don't start somewhere, you can't do that. All right. Any, does that make sense to everybody? Make sense? Anybody think of any other reasons why you would want to sample water? Uh, well, beyond just being healthy for other animals to see whether it is drinkable to us, that is an important thing. I suppose that would somewhat qualify to that same extent. Um, that's one that comes to mind, at least. Yeah, absolutely. Just because we, I mean, all animals are drinking from these sources. Remember, we're talking about 85% of the birds out there in New Mexico depend on our water, depend on the water that we have. Um, think of the diversity of insects, how many insects depend on it. And think about entire ecosystems. If the water is not doing well, then you don't have the things that then supports all that life. So water's not good, the entire system, everything suffers. So we have to be able to quality that. You might want to sample the water to study the, bac the bacteria that's inside. Absolutely, yes. Uh, there's actually been really an interesting, not only bacteria, but also where they've been doing testing now to see how widespread COVID is. And the way they've been doing that is by doing a water sample. You do the water samples. As you sample it, you can then find out how much there of, the, of the RNA is in there from these things. And you can figure out how many people actually probably have it. And by sampling, you can see whether the number or the uh, amount of uh, the number of people with COVID is either rising or dropping. So yes, you can actually monitor that. 
Any other comments? Those are good comments. Any else? Anybody else? All right. So why macroinvertebrates? First off, the easy part is because it's easy to see. Uh, if you can see them, you can sample them. So if you can't see it, it's difficult to try to monitor those. But you can have a quick, easy test by looking to see what types of macroinvertebrates are in the water, things that you can see. That's why. Again, we were talking about how they're put together. Some of them are very sensitive to pollution. And so you, by sampling them and by seeing which ones you have in the environment, you know you have a good idea as to what's, uh, what the water quality is. If you have a whole bunch of one thing, one species, then you know that your water quality isn't very good. They also tend to have a long life cycle. So for example, a dragonfly, you see that right there, the dragonfly, sometimes they can be literally in the larva or in the, in the nymph stage for a couple of years, which means that you have a long-term indicator. Um, they are in there for a long time, gives you an idea as to how many you have. And also, you go to any body of water, you're going to find macroinvertebrates. That's why you want to sample them. You have all of these things that sort of add up to why you're going to be sampling it. It's, it's a quick and easy way to, to sample. And then you have different sampling techniques. When we someday get down to the river, we're going to be using dip nets, which are kind of fun. Go through, you do a sweep, and you do your count, pour it out in a tray. The other one that's really fun are kick trays right here, kick sieves. What you do is you walk into the river, and as you walk into the river, you start walking upstream, and you kick this little screen here, and anything that's in the water is going to then swim right up into, the, into your, your net, and then you go ahead and you pass that into your pan, into your pan, and then you get to sort of do a count. And at each one of them, you just do that count, you get your number of species, and you have a page, an entire page where you can count these things, score it, and you come up with a good water score. Right. Other tests that can be done. Uh, this is kind of, let's see, there we go. Oops, sorry. Uh, chemical tests. These ones, of course, require more information or more, more stuff. Uh, we have tests that are chemical tests where you can do color things in order to then see where you sit with nitrates, dissolved oxygen, acidity of the water, how many of the other toxins that you have. You have tests for lead, tests for just cadmium, all kinds of chemical tests. These ones, you physically take water, you go out and, and, and you can sample and you can get results fairly quickly. And again, you have to have equipment other than just a net and, and an eye, all right? Mechanical test. Uh, this right here is kind of a neat little gauge right here. You drop it down and you measure how low you go into the water before that you, you can no longer see your pattern. And what that'll then tell you is how much silt is in the water. And again, remember we were talking about silt and how that clogs up gills and the more silt you have, the more stuff you have in the water, the more difficult it is for animals to be able to breathe and, and also, you know, the content of it for quality water. You can always grow stuff on agar. What you do then is you take this stuff, you take your water samples, you streak plate it, incubate it. You don't get an answer quickly. It takes a little while to get to the point to where you have some growth on there to be able to see. But this will give you a good, fairly accurate um, count for things like uh, coliforms, things that can cause other illnesses, bacterial born illnesses. Again, this is uh, when you're testing with macroinvertebrates, you get a quick, easy count. This gives you, it takes a little bit longer, but it'll give you an idea as to what the bacteria load is. And now the more recent ones, and I had mentioned this when we were talking about finding out uh, how much bacterial load or viral loads are in the water, you have DNA and RNA tests. So you take a sample of the water, we know the sequence of, of um, 
the sequences of their back of their of their DNA or RNA, and you can then compare it to other things, and you can get a fairly idea, accurate idea as to what kind of critters are in the water that are macros, microscopic, microscopic things like virus and bacteria. So this is, again requires a lot more lab work, but it gives you another idea, another way of looking at at this. Um, but then again, you get back to your invertebrates, quick, easy, and it's a fast way of, of getting a, a good idea as to what it is. These, these are a lot more specific. Any questions about that up to now? Questions, comments, anything else about this? Yes, sir. Uh, and one of the couple slides back, you had mentioned about how uh, dragonflies typically in their uh, larval state, um, how they can spend a couple of years in that point, and you can yeah. say that uh, it can be good to measure a variety of things around them and whatnot. But I was wondering specifically why they spend so long in that state, as it seems other animals sometimes in that state uh, progress a lot faster into their more adult form. And so why is it that dragonflies specifically uh, spend so long in that uh, first state? Well, first off, not all dragonflies spend a couple of years doing that. But typically what happens is the more growth you have, the, more, the, the bigger the organism, the more time it takes to get to that size. So uh, animals like that, what they're doing is they are, they are adapted to doing a lot of their growth, a lot of everything that you're, that you're seeing there, the development in the aquatic stage. And also, if you think about it, where's the nutrients? I mean, if you're in the, living in the water, you're able to catch fish, you're able to catch a variety of different things. Another thing that happens with a lot of these insects, particularly things like dragonflies, is that in order to get to a size before they can metamorphose, they have to be able to spend at least one winter. What that means is that you're gonna be cooled down and that slows their development. And so the next year will be the year when they will actually have been, have enough build up in their size, enough molts in order to be able to then molt to the full adult size of the animal. So not all of them, but certainly things like Dragonflies do take that long simply because they are of, of a big enough size that it takes that long to get there. Does that make sense? Smaller dragonflies and sometimes damselflies, some of them are fast. I mean, mosquitoes are weeks from egg through those stages. Right. So it makes me wonder how long it would take for something like Meganeura to uh, get to its more adult state, considering how big those things were. But <laughs> if you look at oxygen and whatnot, that could also affect it, how fast they grow, I would imagine. That's a really, really interesting question. I wonder, I, that's, a, that's a good one for an invertebrate paleontologist. Uh, mm -hmm. You should write that down because uh, I know somebody who I could ask. <laughs> yeah. Sure. That's fascinating. That's a that's a good question. Yeah, I wonder if there's there's got to be some sort of study on how long did it take that? Yeah. yeah. That's that's a good question. Fascinating. Any other questions, comments? Uh, so I don't know if this is a question that's easy to answer, but what percentage of animals at the Rio Grande, like Bosque area, do you think are invertebrates? What percentage? Oh God, I'm going to go with so the number of species versus I'm going to say something probably 80, 90% of the animals that are on, in the bosque are invertebrates, maybe even higher, maybe 95% of all animals that are going to be in the bosque are going to be invertebrates. Um, think about it. Mammal species in the area, a couple of dozen, um, maybe Maybe 50, uh, I doubt 50 species. I really doubt 50 species, maybe 30 species. Uh, species of fish, not very many. Uh, species of birds, maybe a hundred some species, but then the number of species of insects, hundreds, hundreds of them. Species of other invertebrates, worms, so yeah, my guess is that you're probably talking on the order of 90, 95% of the things that are in the bosque are all invertebrates. Hey Mike, yeah, can, you, can you stop scaring and sharing your screen, Mike, so that we can sure. see you? 
Thanks. Absolutely. How do people study the anatomy of vertebrates? Do they just get like tweezers and like a magnifying glass or something? Uh, give me a second here. I got to put my mask on. My mother-in-law just stepped in, so. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just want to make sure that I don't expose her. So uh, the question was, I'm sorry, you're muted. Oh, um, what I asked was, how do people study the anatomy of invertebrates? Because they're very small. So do they just use a magnifying glass, use really tiny tweezers or something? Yes, the answer is absolutely. One of the fun things that I had a chance to do when I was in school was dissect a whole lot of invertebrates. And on a lot of them, you spend a whole lot of time looking through a microscope. Um, Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, earthworms are kind of fun. You have to open them up in the whole length, pin them out, and then you spend a lot of time under a dissecting microscope finding little bitty, little bitty structures. So um, all the drawings that you see are somebody has spent a lot of time looking through a microscope. Any other questions? So you, you're talking about how for New Mexico and in the Bosque area, 95% or so is of the total animals is just like invertebrates. Mm -hmm. Is it a similar, is it a similar ratio like all across the world or is it just that in a desert environment, invertebrates mm -hmm. are like the, the rulers of the earth? Or rulers of Mexico. Well, invertebrates are rulers of the earth. We think we are, but we are not. Uh, like I said, invertebrates are, I mean, yes, there are some areas where the, where the vertebrates are bigger, but for the most part, we are in the vast minority. Every environment that I can think of, the number of invertebrates way outweighs the number of, um, of vertebrates. Just an idea. Uh, I think somebody one time said that if you weighed all the termites in the world, just termites alone, they probably weigh the equivalent to all of the herbivores that are on the surface of the earth, just for numbers. So yeah, invertebrates rule everywhere. I was on that line of uh, thinking. Uh, you were saying, is there any spot where there's less to that extent where they rule, right? Um, and thinking about that, even though they are in pretty much every single environment or may, quite possibly every single environment, uh, they are the dominating in terms of the amount of species in that area. Is there any area where it dramatically drops down by like 70% of the species are invertebrates or, you know, because it's, it's always such a high number comparative to a lot of the other animals. So I was just wondering if there's uh, areas where there's a, a low diversity comparatively to yeah. uh, Everything numbers, around. right? Hmm, what would be an interesting place where you have? Okay, I would let's not count things like bacteria, viruses, and microorganisms because everywhere you go, there's probably more paramecium. <laughs> Think about your body uh, literally, for every cell that you have in your body that's you, you have a bacteria that's in your body that also makes up you. So let's, let's ignore those. Um, in an environment where you have mostly vertebrates would be probably those areas that are artificially so like human aquariums. <laughs> because that's where basically what you're doing is you're selecting for those things. So the only environment that I can think of where you have a drastically shifted number of invertebrates versus vertebrates would be places where people have made that so. Um, that said, oh, what about okay. volcanoes? Volcanoes? Mm -hmm. uh, volcanoes are actually, there have been found in extremely high, extremely acidic waters 
extremely hot waters, what are called extremophiles. And there is a whole group of bacteria that are called archaeobacteria. And the archaeobacteria are present in waters that can literally would scald anything else. So these are animals, or uh, I should say, bacteria that can survive incredible, incredible extremes. And there is also the possibility that you have bacteria or archaea, or archaea that are circulating around in water that's just above the mantle. So they're everywhere. Um, I can't think of any place where you don't have archaea or some bacteria. Uh, that, that said, there are places where you have zero vertebrates. Fish can only survive down to a certain depth. But if you get to the very, very bottom of Mariana's Trench, the only thing you're going to find down there are invertebrates. Surprisingly, you find things like related to isopods down there. So fish won't make it, but there are certainly invertebrates that are going to be down there as well. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions or comments? When are we going to get to do our own uh, environmental checks of things? Because that might be fun. So tomorrow. To tomorrow. Well, no, we actually tomorrow, even though Mike is not able to join us because of some health issues, um, tomorrow we are going to the, um, the Discovery Pond at the Nature Center. Um, Deb, and I, you, Deb and I will add, you all will be going to Deb and I, and then next, you know, to look for specific aquatic macroinvertebrates. And then next week we'll be doing some water testing of various sorts to understand and with, yeah, within the broader picture of why do these different factors matter, like pH and salinity and more big, you know, turbidity and such. So over the next, yeah, this week and next week, we'll be getting into aquatic macro, you know, and not just aquatic macro inverts, but also terrestrial inverts. And then next week will be water testing. Awesome, awesome. Awesome, Ooh, that'll sauce, be a lot. Yeah. It's going to be so much fun. Can't wait. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so now that you know what you're looking for, uh, I really am anxious to find out what you guys find at the pond. I want to know what kind of diversity you have, what kind of water quality you sort of have come up with as far as what you think the water quality actually is there. It'll be interesting. Any final questions for Mike? Mike, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come join us and talk with us about macro inverts. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. I hope I didn't bore you to death. <laughs> Not at all. All right. Well, 